Okay, welcome again to another episode of Claimant Calling. Um, just two things uh, this, this week. This week we've been all, I think, moved and troubled by the devastating explosions that happened in, in Beirut. Um, the Langham Partnership are uh, a group who uh, work to teach the Christian faith in, in many um, countries where uh, there's not as much access to to books and to learning and to university and, and so on. And um, they, they sent us um, sent out an email um, just the other day because one of the directors of the Langham Scholars who's working with um, uh, sharing the Christian faith and training pastors and so on, a man called, I hope I pronounce his name right, Dr. Riyad Cassis, he lives with his family in the east side of Beirut and he was in touch um, with the Langham Partnership and they passed on his message. I'm sure you folks um, have been praying about Beirut and praying for Beirut, um, but maybe just to fill out how we might be able to pray, Riyadh mentions um, a few things. He, <clears throat> of course, highlighted, the, well, when he wrote the email, there was more than 100 dead. The latest figure I have is 137 when I'm recording this, but I'm sure it will have um, risen and, and still many people missing. The wheat stalks of, for six months um, were burned. Um, churches and, and mosques were badly hit and damaged, as well as homes. There was also destruction of medicine warehouses. Beirut Port is completely destroyed and is going to remain closed for several months, which is going to make it very difficult to import and much more costly to import and much more... Um, demand on the infrastructure to get things from different ports over to, to Beirut and to other places. The electricity company um, was almost completely destroyed. Um, three of the hospitals were damaged and knocked out of operation for a time and might still be um, out, out of operation at the moment, I don't know. And the health system, of course, is under huge strain and collapse. The financial losses are going to millions, and there's a lot of damage to personal property, to shops, apartments, cars. So do remember all of these things, those who have lost homes and loved ones. Do remember the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics who are bearing the brunt of having to provide and tend and, and, and look after folks and who probably are doing that with their own home situation, perhaps, in, in chaos. Do pray for the safety and well-being of the rescue teams as they continue to search. And do pray for the church, the believers in, in Beirut, that they might find strength through Jesus and also in Jesus' name be a helpful encouragement and witness to the folks in the city. The other thing is to ties in with the theme of the service that we recorded for Sunday the 9th. We're looking at um, our series, Come and See, which is a kind of introduction to the Christian faith. And having looked in week one at um, who Jesus was, the question is, why did he come? And the answer quite clearly in Scripture is that he came to save sinners. It raises a whole number of questions, but one of the questions it raises is about, what about good people that don't accept Jesus? What about those who, in our eyes, seem to be really decent folks, but haven't bothered about Jesus? Um, well, to explore something of that, that question, um, we have a short uh, video from uh, Solas. Andy Bannister is, is speaking about that in a, for a few moments, and I, I recommend that to you very much. Thank you. Can you be good without God? That is one of the most explosive questions I think that can be asked whenever people who believe in God and those who don't discuss. Why? Because people have many, many different ways, I think, of misunderstanding the question. What do you think of, in fact, when you hear the question, can I be good without God? Some people hear that question uh, to be implying that if you uh, don't believe in God, you can't be a good person. And it's taken to imply that atheists can't give money to charity, help poor people, help old ladies across the road, rescue kittens from trees. And that's to misunderstand the question, because I think, of course, you can do good deeds without being a believer in God. But here's the thing I want you to think about. Why are those things good? Why is it good to give to the poor? Why is it good to help others? Why is it good to be altruistic or to care for creation? What makes those things good?
If there is no external standard outside of ourselves, how can you have anything other than just personal preference? You see, the problem you have is if there is no God, even talk of goodness just collapses to personal preference. You decide that uh, helping animals or helping the poor is a good thing, while standing over here is somebody else who decides they want to be monstrous and unjust and cruel and unfair. What makes your way right and their way wrong? Or to put it another way, if there is no God, all we have are a set of actions and deeds and some labels marked good and evil. And we each of us gets to run around putting the good and evil labels on the things that we like or don't like. But what's to prevent us simply switching the labels around? You decide that helping kittens out of trees is a good thing. I decide that clubbing them to death and uh, making uh, rugs out of their hides is a good thing. How do we determine who's right and who's wrong? We have no way if there is no God. So to even use the language of good and bad and right and wrong actually implies an external referent point. But there's another issue going on behind this question that I think gets people very heated, is that many atheists perceive that religious people think that it's all about being good, that religious people are people who think they're good and moral and upright and nice living, and that atheists aren't. And of course, my atheist friends get very upset about that, and I can understand why. But here's another question for you. What if true religion, what if true religion has very little to do with being good? You see, what strikes me when you look at the teaching and the life and the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, time and time again, the people he argues with, the people he guns for, are not, uh, are not the immoral people who don't believe in God, it's the religious leaders who do believe in God. And time and time again, he calls them out for the hypocrisy, and he calls them out for, for doing good deeds and following the religious law for all the wrong reasons. Because you can be a moral person because you get, it gains your reputation. You can be a moral person to show off. You can be a moral person because you can use morality as a stick to beat others with and a way to gain power and influence. And Jesus cut through all of it. You see, the message of Jesus is simply this, that each one of us cannot please God on our own efforts, because each one of us has by our mess-ups and our screw-ups and our hang-ups and our self-centeredness chosen time and time again to go our way and not God's way. And if God expected us to somehow earn our way into his favour, we can never make it. And of course, if we thought we did, we would have a lever with which to try and manipulate God. Rather, the message of Christianity is that God loves us so much that even though we are not good people. Jesus Christ was still willing to come and give his life to die for us, to take into himself the wrong things that we had done, take those to the cross and pay the debt for each one of them. Christians are not people who think they are good enough for God. They are people who are humble, who realize all they can do is come to the foot of the cross and look at Jesus and go, it's all about you, not about me, because I am not a good person. The bad news of Christianity is that we are such bad people that Jesus had to die for us. But the good news of Christianity is that God loves us so much that Jesus was glad to die for us. That's the radical claim about God and goodness that is unique to the Christian faith.